This uh, is about the state of the arts in mycotoxin determination. As I said before, there are a couple of uh, control and prevention measures to avoid mycotoxins, but in the first instance, you will have to look for the presence, whether these toxic secondary metabolites are there or not. And that's actually the purpose of my presentation here uh, to present to you the state of the art in uh, the analysis of commodities for mycotoxins. And this will uh, cover uh, a short, uh, so I actually I switched to the wrong screen because I've, uh, I've got my laptop now. So sorry for that. Okay, so this is about the uh, introduction for uh, mycotoxin determination, which will uh, start off with uh, a couple of uh, official analytical uh, methods. Uh, we will be dealing with sampling, with sample preparation, cleanup. Uh, I will also be talking about detection methods, including multitoxin approaches to quantify great variety of different secondary metabolites. Uh, I will also cover a very important aspect, which is often uh, not uh, taking into consideration, which is proper reporting of the results before we uh, will be dealing with uh, CRM, so-called certified reference materials, quality assurance, and uh, last but not least, <coughs> we will also uh, make a short outing to rapid methods uh, and before I'm going to summarize my presentation. So first, I would like to introduce you to uh, the state of the art in mycotoxin determination by also addressing official analytical methods. <clears throat> and uh, when we have a look at uh, those uh, methods which have been established so far, we have uh, in the first instance to, um, to mention the so-called routine methods uh, which cover uh, TLC, so thin layer chromatography, LC UV, so liquid chromatography, <coughs> coupled to UV, spec uh, to, to UV spectrophotometry, uh, then LC uh, mass, mass spectrometry, also GC gas chromatography. <coughs> and out of these routine methods, kind of, kind of as the fundamental basis, so called reference methods uh, have uh, uh, been developed. <coughs> Excuse me and have uh, been approved uh, by AOAC uh, or SEN, what this is uh, will uh, be dwelling on later. Uh, and uh, as a result of the need uh, for rapid methods, ideally for on-site screening, so ideally the ideal device would be so that I have something like a mini roboter. I go uh, in uh, a production plant, I go on the field uh, and do directly analysis uh, of the grain, of the corn cob, like Star Trek, so I have like, something like a laser pistol, and uh, on the laser pistol it then displays, okay, there is uh, three microgram per kilogram aflatoxin in the cob. That is where we want to go. Uh, that's the direction, but we are not there yet. Uh, we still have uh, to deal with ELISA-based techniques based on antibody and the gene reactions, <coughs> uh, also integrated in dipsticks technology. And uh, uh, talking about Star Trek uh, technologies, there are so-called emerging methods <coughs> uh, using, for instance, molecular imprinted polymers, so-called MIPS as innovative uh, separation <coughs> uh, cleanup techniques, fluorescence polarization, infrared, uh, also biochip technology. So there's actually <coughs> a great variety of uh, techniques which uh, uh, have uh, been developed and um, many of those are still under development. <coughs> Talking about the official analytical methods, uh, there are actually SEN and uh, AOC established methods. Uh, SEN uh, being uh, the uh, European Committee for Standardization, uh, they uh, have uh, a working group, number five, biotoxins. Uh, I used to work for SEN myself. Now, uh, Michael Suljok, uh, the uh, head of our multitoxin group, uh, he's now with uh, SEN. And uh, the um, American pendant, so to speak, um, the uh, association of official analytical chemists, 
uh, they establish uh, performance criteria for mycotoxin methods. <coughs> then in Europe, AOC in, in the US, and these performance criteria, for instance, what is the recovery, uh, um, what is the LOD which is required, the LOQ, the limit of quantification for a certain mycotoxin, so that is all um, as laid down by these official bodies. And this is certainly based on uh, collaborative studies where these uh, laboratories who part that participate in these collaborative studies um, report their results and based on the reported results, AOC and SEN uh, are able to establish so-called expert opinions and to come up with these performance criteria. <coughs> the performance criteria fulfill actually uh, the, uh, those uh, uh, laid down by the EU regulations for sampling and analysis <coughs> in this regulation 2006. So certainly this minimum, minimum criteria have to be fulfilled. And in the meanwhile, we've got the 10 SEN and 45 AOC approved methods, which are official reference methods for uh, mycotoxin analysis. However, it has to be pointed out, this is a long, tedious process to establish such a method. Uh, there is also not such a great pressure uh, compared to, let's say, um, glucose core slow level in blood, because everybody needs this. There is actually um, not uh, such a great demand uh, compared uh, to the medical field. Nonetheless, in uh, a joint effort of different European labs, uh, we have now 10 methods available. <coughs> there is more. Uh, AOEC methods, however, t um, it has to be pointed out that these methods uh, by AOEC um, are actually simply there, uh, the, the greater number is based on actually the history of AOEC, which uh, is an um, um, institution which uh, has uh, been established uh, uh, a couple of decades ago, <coughs> and um, there, among these 45 AOEC methods, there are many uh, methods which are only based on thin layer chromatography, so you don't expect too sophisticated methods there. <coughs> I also have to point out that uh, these official methods are not mandatory, so uh, if you are an official control lab, you don't necessarily have to establish uh, these official methods. Uh, I don't know if you work for, for Health Sciences Authority in Singapore, uh, maybe um, the management wants to have uh, such an official method in place uh, to be ready uh, for so-called uh, official control surveillance and in, uh, uh, for, for, uh, to be prepared for cases of dispute that one lab in Singapore um, by repeated uh, analysis they find a level of 5 microgram per kilogram aflatoxin B1 in baby food, whereas the European lab analyzing the same commodity, the same sample, finds 15 microgram per kilogram and then there is a case of this dispute, it maybe end up at court and at court they say, well, <coughs> isn't there any official method? And then they say, well, yes, yeah, yes or no, well, let's say, um, let's assume that there is an official method there for, for that, for aflatoxin B1, for sure, yes. <clears throat> then uh, an, uh, an official control lab will be asked to perform the analysis also with an official reference methodology and <clears throat> this will then be used to solve this dispute. However, using a SEN or an AOC method does not automatically mean that your lab is accurately uh, determining mycotoxins at a high level of trueness because that shall not be mixed up with validation. You can use an AOC approved method. It's a clear descript, described method uh, with a, a couple of analytical steps. But even if you establish that, uh, that method in your lab, it's not automatically in-house validated. Neither is it collaboratively validated. Um, the method is such, yes, but you as um, an individual laboratory will is still lacking the final proof that, you are that, 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 that your measurements are actually uh, comparable um, and uh, provide you with uh, a high level of trueness and uh, precision summarized, uh, so to speak, as accuracy. 
So that is actually something kind of in, in, in England they say pulling, pulling the wool over, over one's eyes. Uh, they're saying, well, we've got an AOC method. Okay, okay, there, if you've got an AOC approved method, then it's okay. It's okay in the first instance if you have a validated method and only in the second instance if it's additionally also AOC approved. So that's that's important message, but we can discuss that later. <coughs> so what about the determination of mycotoxins and its individual steps, which I will actually go, uh, discuss with you now step by step. <coughs> it all starts with sampling, uh, proper sampling, how to take a representative sample, uh, followed by milling, homogenization, extracting the sample, usually with a mixture of water and, or, and organic solvent. Often the water is there <coughs> to make uh, the, uh, make, uh, the uh, commodity more accessible by kind of swelling of uh, this commodity uh, for uh, the subsequent uh, or simultaneous extraction using an or organic solvent. <coughs> then you filter. Uh, usually cleanup is performed in order to remove interfering matrix components such as proteins, fats, carbohydrates and uh, then you have to prepare for the final determination. Uh, I'm mentioning this actually as a separate step because ev evaporating <coughs> from large volumes of your extract to a smaller volume can also potentially result into a loss of your analyte for instance through absorption uh, to, uh, to, uh, adsorption uh, on your glass material and finally detection <coughs> uh, or separation like HPLC high performance liquid chromatography followed by detection by UV <coughs> or MS whatsoever and finally uh, reporting the result. So what I'm going to do right now is within this analytical scheme for the determination of mycotoxin uh, discuss uh, with you the sampling and uh, the milling and homogeneis homogenization step briefly. Um, sampling for mycotoxins in food is always considered as the most critical step. Um, clearly, well, if, if there is a hot spot of, a, let's say, a peanut which contains a 500 microgram per kilogram aflatoxin P1 per kilogram uh, peanut, and you have a couple of other peanuts which are not contaminated at all and you pick the wrong one, uh, kind of non-representative, then you can get completely different results of uh, several hundred percent of differences. <coughs> On the other hand, if you are running a lab like, like, like us, we can only provide some advice, but I'm simply not responsible for the sampling, neither do I have actually <coughs> an idea on what is the purpose of that analysis? Um, is this something where sampling was an issue or not? But nonetheless, I mean, particularly for control purpose, for importing uh, uh, imported grain and so forth, proper sampling is certainly of great importance. The distribution of mycotoxins in products can unfortunately be very heterogeneous. Uh, worst case example, or one of the worst case examples being aflatoxins in peanuts and figs. Uh, one of the best case uh, examples is uh, dioxinivalenol in wheat. So uh, hardly will you find any hot spots there, though it cannot be excluded. Still, there's a possibility of a heterogeneous distribution, but the likelihood for heterogeneity for fusarium toxins is much uh, less than uh, for aflatoxins. There's a new commission regulations, well, new under relative terms, that's the one which is still in place. Uh, 401 2006, uh, which lays down methods uh, of sampling uh, and analysis of the official control of levels of mycotoxins in food. That actually is not only dealing with analysis, with the determination step, it also deals with the sampling <coughs> prior to the analysis. Martin Spanier is uh, uh, well, well known, also works uh, in, in Rotterdam in an official um, uh, control laboratory. He was quoted saying that actually two in food inspectors would need half a working day uh, to sample only one container of just one ship and they have actually hundreds of incoming ships every day. Uh, so that's a challenge on how to find a proper way in performing proper sampling, obtaining a representative sample and not spending months or even years to sample uh, these, um, this, this ship or container. I also would like to point out in the first instance here that the variability uh, 
of uh, the mycotoxin contamination can be minimized through increasing the size of the sample. So the larger your sample is, the more representative. <coughs> and uh, also the subsample, and by decreasing the particle size. So that is why uh, when we are being asked, pr provide us some advice, how to treat, how to homogenize uh, the samples, as a rule of the thumb, we say, well, okay, it, sh it should be homogenized ideally to a grain size of less than 500 micrometers. Yeah? So that is <coughs> uh, one very important aspect. Um, uh, Mrs. Uh, Piselli, uh, she uh, performed a study uh, in uh, 2008, I think, uh, Scarlett Piselli, is that, that, that is the name I was uh, uh, looking for. She uh, checked the distribution of OTA in 26 tons uh, wheat um, in a truck. And uh, what is not uh, depicted here in detail is the value for dioxinivalenol, but the final figure I will come back later. Um, they performed LCMS-MS analysis of a, a homogenized aggregate sample obtained from 100 incremental samples of 100 gram each, so uh, um, <coughs> amounting to a 10 kilogram aggregate sample from 26 tons of wheat. And in addition, they analyzed a 100 individual subsamples. So from every uh, single incremental samples taken from these 26 tons, every single sample was also analyzed. And to see actually, so when I'm, when, when I'm following this European Commission guideline and I take a 100 incremental samples to form one big aggregate samples, what is the variability of the individual toxins in these individual incremental samples <coughs> to point out or to see whether homogenization is an issue or not. And clearly it is an issue for ochradoxin A. The results ranged from lower 0.2 um, nanogram per gram or microgram per kilogram to 8.6 nanogram per gram. So great variability uh, with a coefficient of variation of 200%. Uh, so the results scattered around the mean of plus minus 200%. So that is uh, a sign for uh, <coughs> severe heterogeneity. On the other hand, they also checked for dioxinivalenol, and that actually kind of is a proof of what I've said before, that, uh, the, the, um, that the homogeneity of fusarium toxins is usually much better uh, so uh, they had only a CV of 25% for dioxinivalenol. And that suggested to grind the entire aggregate, so-called bulk sample, prior to subsampling. So the sample comminution uh, is even more crucial than the sampling itself. Not, not meaning or not, not wanting to leave as a major sampling is not important, but the grinding, the homogenization uh, uh, of uh, these incremental samples <coughs> after sampling is as important. And we have uh, uh, last year uh, participated uh, in a sampling workshop uh, which uh, uh, took place at the port of Rotterdam, <coughs> which is I think the second largest uh, port next to Singapore uh, at the World Mycotoxin Forum. It was quite interesting that actually a couple of months later there was the World Nutrition Forum by Biomin uh, in the largest port in Singapore, and that was like the second largest port. You can see actually lots of containers here, uh, and uh, some of those also contain food commodities. <coughs> and uh, that actually sums up the uh, uh, results uh, obtained for a sampling of uh, consignment of ground nuts um, at uh, a warehouse uh, in, uh, in Rotterdam. So there were 18 tons of South African ground nuts to be sampled uh, and analyzed for aflatoxins. <coughs> and uh, there is a regulation uh, for the um, introduction of food and feed from third countries and uh, also commission regulation uh, which controls uh, food and feed of non-animal origin. 
uh, there is actually a, a required control which consists of a documentary check, identity check of the, uh, of the consignment, also a physical check including laboratory analysis and the consignment is actually accompanied by an entry document and sometimes by a certificate of analysis uh, all laid down here uh, in these regulations together with uh, the regulation uh, I've mentioned before, 401 2006, uh, laying down the methods of sampling and analysis. And according to that protocol, uh, <coughs> the uh, sampling was performed and checked whether or not <coughs> these, uh, uh, the, the, these commodities, uh, this lot, uh, exceeds or does not exceed uh, the uh, maximum limit which uh, has been laid down by, um, by the regulators. Uh, there's actually a very important sentence here. Uh, if the analysis of two single random samples yields the same amount, in this case of aflatoxin B1, the consignment is either not contaminated or there has been a fraud. So this is actually the quote of the food inspector there, <coughs> which is kind of um, an eye-opener uh, on what issues we are dealing here with. And <coughs> when we have got here, uh, these regulations, we have a look at these regulations with the commodity. In this case, we've got groundnuts, peanuts or oil seeds, uh, apricot kernels, tree nuts. <coughs> and you can actually see lot weight or weight number of sublots, sub uh, let's say of 25 tons. Uh, you will have to take a number of incremental samples of 100. Similar to Bicelli's uh, um, um, uh, case before, they had 26 tons, 100 incremental samples <coughs> of, uh, um, of um, an aggregate uh, sample weight, in this case uh, to be a 20 kilogram for ground nuts. So you've seen with Bicelli's case uh, that was uh, um, for, for grains. And uh, uh, the number of incremental samples were in this case 200 gram, 100 times each. Uh, so the weight of the aggregate sample, so the <coughs> uh, accumulated uh, incremental samples is, was 20 kilogram, which shall be mixed and divided into two equal laboratory samples of 10 kilogram before grinding, because grinding homogenization, homogenization is so important, as I've uh, mentioned before. Each lab sample of 10 kilograms shall be separately ground finely and mixed thoroughly. So how does do the analysis look like? Well, <coughs> it's just a couple of pictures, uh, also with Franz and Elsa and Heidi and myself. Uh, here you have all these containers with ground nuts uh, where uh, you can sample by uh, putting a stainless steel tube into these uh, sachets and uh, um, performing individual sampling. Uh, then you end up with uh, such pots, uh, do a weighing procedure, uh, you've got a certificate uh, of analysis, recovery uh, and uncertainty of the results is also given here. Uh, so that is all to be taken in, into concentration before final <coughs> uh, evaluation and assessment of these, uh, of these uh, samples. And uh, each of the two identical laboratory samples is treated in the same way in the laboratory. So actually what they perform is slurry mixing. So 10 kilograms of, of sample plus 10 liters of water is actually mixed in a slurry, uh, <coughs> a slurry con con container. Uh, we've got four identical portions uh, which are taken uh, of the hom homogenate uh, for analysis, for backup, for the owner of the consignment in case of the owner of the consignment goes to court for the judge. So these are the four uh, identical portions we need here. And the consignment is released, found as appropriate, by kind of meeting the guidelines, uh, the regulations, if the content of aflatoxin B1 in both subsamples is smaller or equal five, four microgram per kilogram, if the carbo is intended for human consumption. And the question is kind of, so why would you release the concentration of uh, small or equal four microgram per kilogram if the regu like, re regulatory limit for aflatoxin B1 in ground nuts intended for direct human consumption is two microgram per kilogram? So that is the question. <coughs> and that can, be, uh, that can be clarified by looking at a very important aspect of sampling and 
um, regulatory control, uh, we have to take into consideration not only the recovery of the result, but uh, in, as a total, the, and the uncertainty of the measurement. So the an analytical result has to be reported as x plus minus u, which is the expanded measurement uncertainty for which we have got a confidence level of 95%. <coughs> and here, well, that's for 10 ppm, could also be the 4 ppm. So there is actually here a result which uh, less uncertainty above the limit. Uh, the result is above the limit, but limit within the uncertainty. Uh, and here we've got the result plus uncertainty below the limit. And the directive actually clearly states that a sample will be rejected only if it exceeds the maximum limit beyond reasonable doubt, taking into account the measurement uncertainty and the correction of the recovery. So we know, or the lab in Rotterdam, they knew that the relative expanded uncertainty for aflatoxin B1 is a 50%. <clears throat> so which means that if you have got a level of four microgram per kilogram, 50% of four microgram per, per kilogram is a two microgram per kilogram. So meaning that samples which contain lower or equal four microgram per kilogram aflatoxin B1 still fall within this two microgram per kilogram regulatory limit which has been set for aflatoxin B1. And therefore, uh, uh, the maximum limit has not, uh, is not beyond any reasonable doubt and therefore shall not be rejected. It still can be used for human consumption. So that is a, that is a, a very important aspect. So meaning only in this case here, uh, the maximum limit is indeed exceeded and the, uh, the, uh, the lot uh, will be rejected and sent back <coughs> to the owner. Well, <clears throat> the next uh, step after proper sampling uh, and uh, homogenization in the analytical scheme for determination of mycotoxins is extraction, filtration and cleanup. And that is what I will dwell on in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I guess. Um, let's talk about extraction first. So you've seen in my previous presentation that uh, the mycotoxins uh, which are around cover a wide range of chemical properties, polar to apolar, uh, and uh, they can certainly not easily be extracted with one single extraction solvent properly. Uh, and uh, that is why uh, within, our, in, within our effort to accommodate as many toxic secondary metabolites and ideally also accommodating all relevant mycotoxins, within one single analytical method, <clears throat> a major optimization step was actually finding the proper extraction solvent. And when you see here representatives uh, for uh, HT2 toxin and seralanone as uh, more apolar ones <coughs> and nivalanol as a polar one, formonacin as an acidic polar one, uh, we see here the on the y-axis, the extraction efficiency in percent. And in blue, the results, the recovery obtained when extracting with methanol water. And well, not surprisingly, for the highly polar nivalenol, actually that can be quite well extracted with uh, methanol water. Uh, however, for the less uh, polar seralenone or ergocornin, an, uh, an ergot alkaloid, the recovery is actually very poor. Too poor because when you're something like a five to seven percent, uh, that is uh, non-acceptable. Uh, what is actually the reason why we want to have a reasonable high recovery? A lower recovery certainly um, potentially limits the sensitivity, the limit of detection of your method. <clears throat> but more importantly, lower recovery usually yields in a, in a lack of precision of your method as well. So we, one can summarize at such a low recovery rate, the method is not under control. <clears throat> so moving on to acetyl nitrile water, 84 plus 16 in ratio, uh, results displayed in red. Actually, quite, um, quite a, a fine uh, extraction solvent, <coughs> suitable, however, for formonacin B2, 
uh, we again have an extraction efficacy of uh, only about uh, uh, 10%. So, well, this short story, which I kind of tell you in a couple of minutes, uh, was actually an undertaking of a couple of months. Yeah? So that is, has also to be uh, pointed out at this uh, point. Um, by adding acetic acids to acid and nitrile water, we actually, in green, could still achieve reasonable recovery, but for, mon for monosine P2, um, still, not a, still not a fantastic recovery, but it's getting there, it's actually, uh, it can be uh, under these circumstances of actually having to find a compromise be considered as uh, something like a reasonable recovery. <coughs> so best compromise for maltotoxin approach, in this case for wheat, low water content, low pH, uh, and uh, in, the, uh, in this uh, uh, range uh, of acetonitrile water, acetonitrile uh, uh, acetic acid, 7921. Well, <coughs> once extraction has, uh, was uh, performed uh, successfully, and in case you're not pursuing a multi-analyte, a multi-toxin approach to cover ideally a, hun a, a couple of hundreds of metabolites, um, a way forward to get rid of matrix interferences on the one hand, but also to purify, to uh, get higher concentrations of uh, your analyte. On the other hand, is solid phase extraction. So what you've got actually is, uh, for instance, a, a polyethylene cartridge <coughs> with a solid phase extraction material that can be alumina oxide, can be silica, uh, silica uh, uh, C18 or C8 modified uh, si silica to make it more apolar. So you perform the conditioning then you add your sample extract, which contains a couple of interfering components, but in red, also your mycotoxins of interest. Then you perform a rinsing step, where you add a solvent, which uh, is able to remove the matrix from, uh, the, from uh, the solid phase extraction material. So <coughs> this solvent has obviously a higher affinity for these interfering components. That is why they are eluting into the mobile phase, but are not sufficiently uh, uh, affine uh, towards the mycotoxins, so that is why the mycotoxins will still stick and remain uh, there uh, at the column. And the final step, you perform an illusion uh, with, uh, for instance, pure acetonitrile or could be pure water in order to, uh, to elute nivalenol, <coughs> and you get your analyte. Two advantages, one, you can actually get rid of interfering matrix components. Second one, uh, you can actually uh, purify, enrich the compound of interest, enrich your mycotoxin, <coughs> because when you add a 100 milliliter of your extract and then you elude with one milliliter, you have an enrichment factor of 100. <coughs> but you can use the solid phase extraction column in different modes, right? You can also uh, play it the way that you don't elude but you add your sample, your matrix uh, remains on the, on, on, the, on, on the cartridge and your uh, analyte, your mycotoxin, goes through uh, the column right away. There are different ways um, and different strategies. Uh, <coughs> nowadays, actually, polymer-based columns, uh, even integrated in 96 well plates, are on the market, <coughs> which have already got an integrated uh, solid phase extraction material. Well, this is a, a, a method to, uh, a uh, cleanup method which is quite well known at, on this campus, which because it's uh, <coughs> uh, sold by, by, by Roma Labs, they have developed this so-called Microsep column. So you've got a culture tube here, uh, a, a maize extract containing your uh, matrix components, but also your mycotoxin of interest in red. <coughs> then you have got a column. Uh, this, uh, this plastic column is filled again with a mixture actually of uh, different packaging materials, adsorbents, charcoal, saline, uh, ion exchange resins, and so forth. And then you push that column into this culture tube, and it actually is cultured, uh, the, uh, into this culture tube, and this um, column which you push into the culture tube has a one-way valve here, and uh, your extract will be pushed through this one-way uh, valve, uh, and uh, at the top, 
uh, of the column, the purified extract appears, and then actually you can pipe it, the purified extract, ideally containing only the mycotoxin of interest, <coughs> uh, can be ejected in the column, uh, or in the column of the HPLC uh, or LCMSMS method. Rapid extraction in uh, less than half a minute, removal of the matrix, however, uh, mainly restricted to trichothecine and no enrichment because you just push through and you've got the same, ex you've got the same concentration of the, of the mycotoxin in this tube <coughs> as uh, at the top of uh, the, of the column. <coughs> that is why um, to increase the specificity or, my best, or more precisely the selectivity of the column in combination with, uh, with uh, purification and enrichment of the component, immune affinity columns have <coughs> been developed. You have again uh, these plastic uh, uh, um, housing in which, uh, in this case, um, sepharose, agarose, uh, is uh, immobilized, um, um, containing a couple of analytes, uh, sorry, a couple of antibodies which are specific for uh, certain mycotoxins. So these are, for instance, specific aflatoxin antibodies. You first perform a preconditioning of this column in kind of to make the antibodies active again so that they can rearrange themselves into the, <coughs> into the uh, solvent. Uh, then you add your sample extract, which contains matrix components here in blue and in red, your mycotoxin of interest. Then you perform a rinsing and a drying step, so you get rid of all the matrix components which are still in the solution somewhere dissolved in your column. And only the mycotoxins, because of their specific uh, affinity to the uh, anti-mycotoxin antibodies, will remain on the column. And finally, usually by addition of a pure organic solvent, as for instance acetonatural, you kind of kill the antibody to kill its three-dimensional structure. It releases the mycotoxin again, and actually, it, and you can find it in the uh, elution solvent. <coughs> Whether this is always needed to uh, use pure organic solvent, um, that is to be discussed. That is to be found out for the individual column. If you would like to save costs, actually, you can find conditions wh which are organic enough in order to elute the, the analyte so that the antibody releases the mycotoxins but does not kill the antibody. Um, so that is uh, the ideal case. If you would like to be on the safe side, well, then use uh, pure acetonitrile. So several immune affinity column uh, have been developed for deoxynivalone, seralanone, aflatoxins, OTA, formonacins, <coughs> have also been validated in European collaborative trials. And actually, just a couple of years ago, the so-called six-in-one column, there are actually six mycotoxin-specific antibodies uh, immobilized in one single <coughs> immune affinity column has been developed. Uh, pretty expensive, I think uh, 200 uh, euro plus, um, uh, but um, that has to be decided uh, in for your particular analytical task whether this is worth the investment or not. <coughs> this, this shows actually uh, the, uh, the power of an immune affinity column. So you see actually here uh, between 2.5 minutes and 7 minutes, there's actually just one peak, although this is a maze matrix uh, where actually a seralinone eludes and actually it shows that uh, this is a really selective method in combination with uh, liquid chromatography and fluorescence detection <coughs> after immune affinity cleanup with a reasonable uncertainty of 6% and an LOD of 3 microgram per kilogram. So um, that is just to demonstrate that uh, these, uh, me uh, these methods actually work pretty well. So once you have uh, forgotten about all the things you learned at the Mycotoxin Summer Academy, you can always go back to your script and you find a summary of the major advantages and drawbacks of major cleanup methods for mycotoxins here. Uh, we've sold it phase extraction uh, with uh, the advantage of uh, enriching the analyte of interest. You've also got a great variety of materials which is available on the market where you can play around with chemical properties. On the other hand, it's more time consuming. 
uh, than other methods uh, and you have got this limited selectivity when compared, for instance, to immunoaffinity columns. <coughs> Microsep or also multi-sep multi columns, they are really the easiest on the market. I would say they are very rapid. However, uh, no enrichment is achieved, uh, especially with the Microsep columns and they are less selective. Uh, also compared to the immunoaffinity columns, which uh, show the highest selectivity due to the specific antibody and the gene um, uh, reaction. Uh, we have got an enrichment um, of uh, the mycotoxin of interest, however, uh, high costs and often uh, only for single toxins on the market, but that's, that is actually also gradually changing, but then again, the costs rise. <clears throat> the question uh, we, have to, uh, we, have, we have to ask ourselves nowadays particularly in view of LCMS, CMS technologies, is how selective actually has a cleanup really uh, to be. <coughs> and that actually brings me uh, to um, the next step uh, to the separation and detection um, by, for instance, HPLC UV or LCMS, CMS within this analytical scheme for determination of mycotoxins. And when we, we, we see actually here <coughs> a quite a rapid transition uh, or impressive transition um, when uh, checking the uh, methods which are around for aflatoxin B1 uh, based on the results uh, uh, of uh, WHO and FAPAS, WHO, well, the World Health Organization, obviously, FAPAS, uh, the profic proficiency testing scheme um, offered by FERA in uh, York. And in 1978, you had actually a uh, predominance of TLC methods in red, a couple of HPLC methods in <coughs> yellow, and some other methods uh, around 1990. Um, there was uh, already uh, as many HPLC methods uh, around as TLC-based method, and now <coughs> TLC methods, uh, I would say, are almost entirely um, restricted to uh, uh, developing countries uh, to some field laboratories uh, and there's a majority of HPLC methods. These HPLC methods also with uh, some uh, with a percentage of ELISA methods <coughs> are used uh, also uh, in combination or in, uh, in uh, coupling not only with UV uh, based uh, detection methods but also with uh, mass spectrometry. Well, when we look at uh, the multi-analyte methods uh, which were available in 1998, uh, <clears throat> we were actually back then very proud to be able uh, to distinguish between seralinone and its metabolites which are formed in the, in the liver and which are actually more estrogenic than its parent molecule, <coughs> alpha and beta seralinol. Uh, at the same time, we were pretty... Uh, happy to be able to uh, distinguish between deoxynivalenol 3, 15 acetyl don, fusarenone X, uh, and to perform that type of analysis with uh, gas chromatography coupled either to electron capture detector <coughs> or to uh, mass spectrometry. And uh, this method is actually still available, still in use by some labs, although it's um, increasingly been replaced by LCMS methods, but just from a chemical point of view to, to demonstrate to you what actually is needed in order to be able to detect, to quantify uh, mycotoxins, uh, especially polar ones as nivalenol or deoxynivalenol. Uh, well, the prerequisite for any gas chromatographic technique is that your, that your substance has to be volatile enough to evaporate. Does the oxynivalenol evaporate quickly? No, it's uh, too polar for that. Uh, so uh, in order to evaporate it, you need either high temperatures, but another prerequisite of gas chromatographic determination is not only evaporation, but also that this compound evaporates at the temperature where it is, where it is not decomposing, right? Because you want to have the entire uh, active molecule. And uh, that can be done by so-called silanization step, for instance with uh, tricell DPT, which actually, uh, which is a, a commercial name, which introduces 
tri methyl silane groups uh, at the positions of the OH groups and all of, a, all of a sudden you get rid of the OH groups, you get rid actually of um, the, the uh, uh, hydrogen uh, bonding uh, which uh, is otherwise there and this molecule is then uh, ready to, in, to inject into the gas chromatogram into the gas chromatograph uh, in order to detect it by gas chromatography. <coughs> Another possibility is uh, the addition of heptafluorobutyryl imidazole. Again, you get rid of the OH groups. So again, it's uh, evaporated at reasonable temperature. <coughs> and I mentioned actually that there is a very common detector is the electron capture detector, as mentioned here. And the electron capture detector actually can detect compounds which have a high electronegativity. So they are actually have a high affinity towards electrons. And with that method actually you are introducing not only apolar bonding but also a lot of fluorine atoms and with the uh, introduction of these fluorine <coughs> atoms uh, this compound is uh, becoming highly electronegative and therefore uh, increases the sensitivity of the method when detected by GCECD. The same is actually applied when performing GCMS measurements. However, the introduction of these fluorine groups is then not so, so beneficial because mass spectrometry <coughs> uh, is not dependent on these electronegative groups. Actually, the other way around, because there's also a problem with derivatization, once you add a der derivatizing agent to your, to, your, uh, to your sample, you also derivatize all the other components which are in your sample and not only the mycotoxins, so also, also your background noise will increase because all the, all the other components which you, don't in which you are not interested to, 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 to detect uh, will be fluorinated and thus give you actually um, an increased background noise. <coughs> Well, this is uh, how our LCMS and this is how I, I looked like uh, 10 years ago. Uh, so you see uh, some transformation here as well. Um, the machines are getting newer, I'm getting older. And uh, that is actually in our Christian Doppler Laboratory, which is actually a huge national funding stream, uh, which can fund um, the res research of uh, uh, potentially high, uh, high, high, high potential research, researchers, about 60 are, are funded um, over a period of seven years. Franz Bertilla and Sabine are among those now. And um, that is the machine which we uh, obtained in 2003, our first LC tandem mass spectrometer. <coughs> and uh, when we look actually at the development just over the last eight years, this is just phenomenal. Yeah? So we uh, uh, developed our first method with this QTRAP 2000, an LCMS method. We covered nine mycotoxins. Uh, we used the Microcept cleanup, so uh, we still use the cleanup. So now actually uh, that is not the case anymore. And we had a limit of detection of 65 picogram on the column, yeah? because when you that is uh, kind of confusing. Maybe we usually we talk about microgram per kilogram and so forth, but that is the actual total amount when you inject the 100 microliter of a certain concentration. In turn, you can detect, uh, you, you can calculate the actual total amount of the substance itself you are uh, injecting on the column, and that was 65 picogram, actually with a nice chromatogram. <coughs> so a couple of years later, Michael Suljok was already in the team. So you see, uh, now they are twins. Uh, again, an LCMSMS method was in place with 39 mycotoxins and for the first time without any cleanup. And that is, by the way, uh, this 39 mycotoxin is the most cited paper in the history of, 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 of uh, the Center for Analytical Chemistry. Um, and it's the second most cited paper in the history of the IFA Tulln. So this does say something because uh, it really was a breakthrough. <coughs> 39 mycotoxins, no cleanup, and look, LOD for dioxinival and all 10 picograms. So it actually was again lowered down. That was actually extended to an 87 toxins 2007. 87 toxins is actually the 
uh, total number of toxins which are commercially available. So you cannot buy more standards, not, not even at BioPure Roma Labs. <coughs> um, and it was extended then through a network of collaborators which, uh, who were so kind to provide their, uh, their additional secondary metabolites to 186, <coughs> and which culminated, so to speak, in an LCMSMS method with electrospray with 350 fungal, bacterial, and um, plant metabolites uh, with uh, actually an LOD which went down from a 65 pic picogram on the column in 2005 to a 0.3 picogram on the column. So you see a tremendous development. And this low LOD, this high sensitivity, is actually also the reason why we are now also able to look into biomarkers, to look into the mycotoxins and their metabolites in the urine, because otherwise that's not possible, that's not feasible without any uh, proper sensitive uh, <coughs> instrumentation. We are now going high res. So uh, recently, uh, Sylvia, she performed also the first uh, high res FT orbit rep MS measurements for, to detect mycotoxins in food. Uh, she screened for about 200 fungal metabolites. Uh, this was actually the, the purpose of this work was not to come up with a new world record, but to demonstrate whether or not uh, high res MS uh, and how easily or uh, difficult uh, that is uh, to uh, perform accurate quantification that was also found to be appropriate. However, we are talking here about an instrument which is a 700,000 euro. So this is not the instrument you would buy in the first instance in order uh, to detect a couple of mycotoxins. That is also reflected LCMA by, by, by the uh, easy web of science. Uh, LCMS method for mycotoxin determination in the literature, quite impressive, published items in each year, 1993, I think two or three papers. One of those was from, was from our side in collaboration with the TU Vienna. Now we've got uh, about 80 papers, uh, 2013 will be higher, but the citation each year of LCMS-based method uh, is quite impressive. So in 2011, this was about 800, and uh, a year later, it's almost doubled. Yeah? So it's really an, almost an exponential <coughs> increase of LCMS-MS users. However, there are a couple of uh, <coughs> challenges which have to be met. Uh, careful optimization of the extraction solvent. I've alluded to, to that before, because we are injecting actually the diluted crude extract, so the idea is to get rid of the matrix components by diluting the matrix effects kind of to disappear to, to kind of to, to, uh, to a level where it almost is not present anymore, by at the same time ensuring that there are still a couple of molecules left, a couple of mycotoxin molecules left, which are still uh, feasible to be detected by a sensitive LCMS methodology. We've got a wide range of relevant concentrations. So in a multitoxin approach, you have got aflatoxin B1 at a, at a lower microgram per kilogram, whereas deoxynivalenol has a regulatory limit of 1,500. So that is also a challenge as far as working, uh, working uh, range linearity sensitivity is concerned. <coughs> Uh, optimization of the chromatographic separation and also the ionization conditions is important. Um, have we got any signal suppression in the electrospray uh, or matrix effects? So that cannot be discussed now in, in every detail in my short introduction here. We will learn about this uh, during this week and uh, also during next week. <coughs> and certainly we go from screening towards quantification. It's not only that we can say qualitatively this compound is there, we can actually quantify the concentration and that is what counts. Uh, just to give you an idea on chromatography, <coughs> uh, elution of formonis and uh, formonis, uh, is at neutral pH. You see uh, FB1 has a tailing, H H uh, FB2 is almost uh, uh, impossible to, to, to find a peak. Once you reduce the dissociation of the carboxylic function, of the carboxylic acid of the formonacin by adding um, uh, ammonium uh, acetate uh, or acetic acid, uh, this uh, dissociation reduction actually uh, immediately uh, results into nice and sharp peaks which do not only contribute to a better sensitivity of the method but also <coughs> to a better uh, selectivity. Well, 
There is tandem mass spectrometry. That is the method of choice which uh, we have been using for the last decade uh, with uh, three quadrupoles, one selecting the molecular ion, then you've got a fragmentation uh, by the uh, collision with nitrogen, and then you select a third fragment. Uh, uh, in the third quadrupole, you select a fragment of, for instance, seralinone. So what you uh, actually perform is select a direction monitoring from a precursor to a product ion. This will all be dis uh, discussed by by, uh, by Franz, maybe he hasn't got such a nice video as I do. Um, so just to give you an idea on the, on, on the coming week or weeks, so after focusing your, your ions in a quadruple zero, uh, you have got another mass filter with an electromagnetic field in quadruple one with overlaying direct and uh, uh, alternating current. Only the mycotoxin of interest in blue is able to migrate further uh, then collides with uh, nitrogen atoms in quadruple number two, fragments are produced, and then in quadruple number three, uh, again through the application of a certain electromagnetic field, only the fragments which you have selected before are able to uh, migrate further to passage through quadruple number three and to reach the uh, detector. <coughs> this is uh, another example with UPLC, so the next generation of LC, is ultra uh, performance liquid chromatography, even smaller columns, even smaller diameters, uh, <coughs> where Elisabeth Varga has developed a method which covers 242 mycotoxins and those other uh, fungal and bacterial metabolites, um, where um, we had uh, improves, um, improved the chromatographic resolution. So that is actually with an uh, HLN instrument. Uh, all the other measurements were performed with uh, from applied biosystems, and that met method was also published only uh, recently. <coughs> um, what, is, what matters in, um, in LCMS is actually so-called matrix effects. So when you, you, when you still have got an API 2000, and you want to convince your boss that you need an, an update, uh, let's say, uh, API 6000 or uh, whatever the company uh, brand names are, then show him this graph. Uh, you see here, uh, actually, this is the graph uh, spiked mi in microgram per kilogram, uh, a sample, a maze sample, uh, and here you, you find, uh, you see the found microgram per kilogram, that actually this 45 degree line uh, is the one which you would like to end up with, but this is actually the graph which you will obtain due to a lack of ionization in the electrospray, your uh, calibration graph uh, is uh, uh, not showing the slope which actually it should show, only after uh, uh, adding a so-called internal standard or by purchasing an instrument which has a more effective um, ionization process in your electrospray so that uh, this a measurement is then not as uh, dependent on uh, matrix effect because the matrix components do interfere with the electrospray uh, process. And uh, you will also hear during the week about isotope dilution methods <coughs> where actually you add to your analyte of interest, uh, which is displayed uh, in, in green, uh, also um, um, your, uh, sorry, which is displayed, uh, displayed in red. In green, you add your uh, internal standards, and the idea is by adding an internal standard, which is a standard which is the same component as the one you want to detect. Let's say for dioxinivalenol, um, you have um, uh, got um, um, 15 uh, carbon atoms, I think. Then you have actually uh, a mass which is 15 higher when all C12 isotopes are replaced by C13 uh, isotopes. And uh, this is ideally an internal standard, is a standard which does either contain deuterium atoms or C13 uh, isotopes, so that you've got the same molecule, but it has a higher mass. And it, this uh, internal standard based on C13 material then undergoes the same losses during the sample preparation, and you can directly compare the MS peak area or height by saying, okay, the ratio of the intensity of the internal standard to the analyte is the same as the concentration of the internal standard to the, your analyte of interest, and then actually you can calculate uh, your, um, your concentration without the need even 
for <coughs> external calibration uh, by um, comparing uh, the results, for instance, that is your reference value of 470 um, with, uh, with your internal standard corrected. So you see actually when you use your internal C13 label standard, you find uh, almost exactly the levels which are certified. However, without any internal standard, you find actually much lower value that is, ex explains also the lower slope. No need to understand that right away, but kind of uh, already alluding to uh, the lectures to come. What is important is proper validation of any method, also including a multi-toxin method. <coughs> For each of these toxins, you have to uh, calculate LODs, uh, uh, LOQs, limits of quantification. The overall so-called apparent recovery, uh, which is all kind of uh, in, a, in, a, in a range uh, which is uh, very convenient with lower microgram per kilogram for trichothecines, only for aflatoxins, uh, uh, multitoxin method should, had, uh, has to be further optimized in order to meet the regulatory standard. Apparent recoveries, uh, except for formonesins and for aflatoxins, uh, in a, a very a good range, uh, with the limitation for formonesin, uh, actually um, 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 the extraction procedure, which is not com as complete as it should be, with aflatoxins, the major limitation is actually signal suppression as a result of matrix components, which kind of hinder uh, the uh, a proper um, electrospray ionization process. So for the quantitative analysis, um, matrix match calibration is uh, therefore often required. So you do not perform a calib calibration sequence by just having different concentrations of your mycotoxin in a pure organic solvent. You perform a maize extract, which is not contaminated, or peanut powder extract, which is not contaminated ideally with uh, aflatoxin or any other mycotoxin. And then you add, you spike your analyte of interest to the matrix extract and perform a matrix batch calibration, or alternatively, if available, using a C313 labeled standard. <coughs> this method for the multitoxin method has also been validated for a couple of matrices, which I'm not uh, wanting to go into detail here. But what is, so f what is the great thing about uh, multitoxin approaches is the fact that uh, you find very interesting new metabolites. Uh, here we found patolin in apple, pear, coffee residues in filter. Who would actually expect to find patolin in coffee residues in filter? Uh, Ocradoxin A in cream fresh, formonacin in garlic, bovaricin in onion and garlic, moniliformin in garlic. They're very high concentrations. But these were all visibly moldy foodstuffs. So this is not what you can expect when you kind of, I don't know, drink your coffee. You wouldn't expect high levels of patolin there. But uh, this, is, uh, this is the range of toxic secondary metabolites which uh, you can detect. Uh, and which you would never find if you would not applying a multitoxin method because you would simply not um, look for these strange combinations. Yeah, well, I'm not going into detail of this. I've already uh, um, shown you in my previous uh, slides um, the, um, uh, the great range of different metabolites which you can detect uh, in uh, food commodities and also feed commodities once uh, you apply this multitoxin approach. Uh, what is quite interesting to see is that the regulated, the first regulated toxins on the list, dioxinival was only the 21st in frequency of all the toxins which we found. Uh, so uh, kind of um, an interesting finding and which is also in line with what uh, Gerd Schatzmeier said before, also with a high frequency of unusual toxins. Uh, we have also reported for the first time in natural contaminated foods, uh, melagrin, agroglavin, uh, as uh, ergot alkaloids and other um, exotic um, metabolites which have not even, even been properly um, checked for toxicology yet. Another possibility besides LC tandem mass spectrometry is the use of LC time of flight mass spectrometry um, that has also been used for quantifying uh, a couple of mycotoxins. The advantage of TOF, and this will also be elaborated during the course of the week, is full scan sensitivity over a wide mass range. 
and you can actually apply a database screening even long after actual analysis. So that is, I think, the ideal tool, let's say, for checking the metabolite spectrum over a couple of years to, to check for potential influence of global warming. Why? Because in LZ tandem mass spectrometry, one has to select the analytes before you perform your analysis. Here, you can actually select the analytes even 10 years after you have performed the analysis because you do a full screen of all the masses, masses which are there and don't select them beforehand. Problem, you need large storage uh, place in order to store this large volume of all this data. It takes longer. Uh, it's not as uh, sensitive. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, some unexpected findings uh, are possible, as for instance uh, with uh, uh, so-called masked mycotoxins, uh, where uh, the bondage of deoxynival and glucoside, which I've uh, already presented in my previous slide, uh, was for the first time detectable uh, in actually Franz Bertiller's uh, PhD thesis, and he actually found out that up to 45% of deoxynival in wheat samples occurs as additional conjugated Don 3 glucoside, which can certainly have implications also for food safety, uh, especially uh, in, in case <coughs> um, the, um, the parent mycotoxins might be released after enzymatic hydrolysis uh, in the gastrointestinal tract. And uh, this can also be used for targeted analysis of fungal metabolites. So if you, what we did is actually adding seralinone to Arabidopsis thaliana and see what is the capability of a plant to metabolize a mycotoxin. And actually, you see, with th even with thumb and mass spectrometry and precursor ion scan, 97% uh, of the seralinone was metabolized in within 24 hours with a great variety of different metabolization products, uh, D-glucosides, malolin glucosides, uh, sulfates, uh, seralinols, and so forth. So, quite an amazing capability of plants to degrade, to metabolize mycotoxins to other components um, than the usual uh, mass mycotoxins which we have got in mind and which actually uh, is uh, um, 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 uh, uh, a research field on its own. And that actually leads us towards metabolomics where we combine our uh, sample preparation with high resolution mass spectrometry and gas chromatography, so LC high resolution mass spectrometry combined with gas uh, chromatography with MS to cover the whole set of all possible uh, uh, small molecules, uh, secondary metabolites which are formed by an organism. Um, that is actually done by Rainer Schumacher, he's the head of our metabolomics group. You get a two million peaks of masses. You need bioinformaticians in order to reduce that to a reasonable uh, size of uh, possible compounds. In this case, actually nine bioinformation compounds were found with actually a new generation, uh, so to speak, of uh, mycotoxins which we have uh, detected. Uh, uh, the so-called, uh, we, uh, we, we metabolized deoxynival alone on wheat and after metabolization of deoxynivalanol in wheat, we, on, we, we found deoxynivalanol glucoside. We found some 5% of remaining deoxynivalanol, but we found actually Don S GSH, which is actually glutamyl, uh, cysteine, uh, and uh, glycine, uh, the so called uh, Don glutathione pathway derived uh, metabolites, uh, which is actually uh, a new. A new uh, discovered a uh, range of uh, mass mycotoxins. We don't know anything about their toxicity. I think they are pretty unstable, but nonetheless, uh, that shows another detoxification potential of plants to metabolize deoxynivel and all to less toxic compounds because uh, uh, xenobiotics like uh, pesticides, uh, which is used to treat grass, uh, your lawn in your garden, uh, does also uh, include so-called pesticides uh, or herbicide saveners, which kind of activate the glutathione thion pathway in order to make the pesticides, the herbicides, less toxic for the grass. So that actually is a well-known well phenomena which has so far, so far not been detected by, um, by uh, the 
uh, in, in the mycotoxin uh, community. And what I wanted to point out here is uh, uh, the area of biomarkers of exposure. I have already mentioned that uh, now with the sensitive uh, methodology which is available, uh, we are now <coughs> able to also detect dioxinivalenol and its uh, glucuronides, so the oxidized form of uh, glucose uh, in, uh, in, in, in urine. So uh, that is actually quite an interesting experiment. So when you are uh, exposed to a regular diet, you uh, quite likely, if you're an Austrian, uh, find levels of uh, 30 to 100 microgram per liter dioxinivalenol glucuronide in your, in, in, in your urine. <coughs> and uh, uh, Benedict Bartz, who uh, performed his PhD thesis in this area, then actually restricted himself to a couple of days living in austerity, uh, co only consuming potatoes. Uh, which were free of dioxinivalenol, and you see actually the black baseline that actually, uh, if he is not consuming any potentially dioxinivalenol containing diet, uh, there is also no glucuronide, no biomarker in his urine. So that can actually be used <coughs> to study uh, biomar these biomarkers of exposure uh, in, uh, in uh, developing countries where there is a, a a more likely exposure to multiple mycotoxins. And uh, actually uh, from here is just an example from a patient in Cameroon. Uh, six mycotoxins and metabolites like uh, nivalenol, don glucuronide, don aflatoxin in one uh, FP1 uh, were detected simultaneously. That's not the latest study. There's actually a, a more recent one, but this actually is a very impressive picture. Where you see actually in the urine where we are able to, to determine the mycotoxin itself and its glucuronide uh, kind of transformation, detoxification products produced in the liver. By the way, as some of you might know, cats have, do not have this possibility of detoxifying in the liver uh, to their glucuronide. That is why they are much, much more susceptible uh, to uh, mycotoxins. <clears throat> well, now it's about the results. So how within this analytical scheme for the the determination of mycotoxin, can I report my <coughs> result? And you see here the, uh, an intercomparison study which was carried out in 1998, so a long time ago, <coughs> for the determination of seralinone in mace. And you see here the mean value of all the participating laboratories, which is around 73 microgram per kilogram. And you can see here certainly uh, in uh, uh, coded, so this uh, was uh, certainly um, um, the participants uh, were not uh, revealed. Um, we see here the individual mean values and their uncertainty reported. Uh, and these values ranged from about 14 microgram per kilogram up to a 140 microgram per kilogram. So that was certainly unacceptable because uh, they knew right away that the level will be somewhere between 10 and uh, 500 microgram per kilogram. So I think uh, you would possibly get the same result by just uh, um, um, randomly picking any number between uh, uh, this range and you will, have, you will possibly get a similar result. So the CV, the coefficient rate of variation was plus minus 40.5%. <coughs> No common calibrand was provided here, so each lab also used its own calibrand, and that actually also contributed to uh, this uh, <coughs> result, uh, which was not very satisfactory. I'm going to skip that part. We have already talked about recovery and uncertainty, that this is an, an, an important <coughs> uh, part, so definitely one has to mention, calculate the recovery, uh, and also to calculate the uncertainty in order to get comparable results. Um, what I've not mentioned before is that there's an email address for those of you actually who would like to calculate the uncertainty of their measurement result. There's a Eurocamp guide <coughs> quantifying the uncertainty in analytical measurement, uh, which you can use uh, in order to calculate uh, a measurement uncertainties. Within the concept of measurement uncertainty, in, within the concept of tra traceability of your results, uh, it is very important to have certified reference materials and proper quality assurance in place. I quote here from the FAO WFO report uh, by CHECFA, the joint uh, 
the uh, Joint uh, Expert Committee on Food Additives uh, that an analytical quality assurance system should include, when possible, systematic use of reference materials or ideally certified reference materials which are accompanied by certificate and also regular participation in interlaboratory comparison studies in order to be able <coughs> to demonstrate comparability and uh, that your results are not prone to any type of systematic error. Uh, nowadays there are 12 certified reference materials for six mycotoxins available mainly through uh, <coughs> the IRMM, the Institute for Reference Materials and Measurements in Gale, but also for FACBAS in, in York. So we've got aflatoxins in milk powder as a calibrant in peanut butter. Uh, we've got agrotoxin A in wheat, dawn in maize and wheat, seralanone in maize, a seralanone calibrant, and also dawn in nivalanol calibrants. By the way, uh, this group of dawn and seralanone certified reference materials have been produced uh, by uh, the Center for Analytical Chemistry. Um, that was uh, my early work uh, 10 years ago where I um, um, had the pleasure to um, coordinate two European Commission funded projects uh, to that particular topic. So how does a certified uh, a certificate uh, which accompanies a certified reference material look like? So we've got a compound here, seralanone, estrogenic mycotoxin, We've got a certified value of 83 microgram per kilogram, an uncertainty of 9 microgram per kilogram, which uh, corresponds to the expanded uncertainty um, um, within a, a confidence level of 95%. <coughs> we had 18 laboratories participating here, contributing to this uh, mean value, this certified value. But this uncertainty does also take into account, by the way, not only the uncertainty of the measurement, but also long-term uh, stability of the material because they want to sell this material also in 10 years from now and they have to demonstrate uh, the, uh, the, uh, the stability, but also in case of slight instability, so what is the contribution of potential instabilities to the uncertainty of uh, this uh, result. <coughs> kind of proper use for certified reference materials, there's a, a guide provided by IRMM, which I would like to point out that this is, uh, might be the best one to use. Just as an introduction, if you would like to make a long story short, the agreement criterion of the X, uh, of your mean value, the mean uh, of your measurement results and of the true value uh, which is given in the certificate, this <coughs> difference shall not be greater than
relevant mycotoxins there are antibodies available highly sensitive highly selective obviously due to the specific antibody and the gene interactions <coughs> and well as we are talking about rapid methods it's a quick method uh, however more matrix dependent than chromatographic methods uh, ELISAs are also not actually eligible to participate in uh, the certification of a reference material because the results are st still uh, too inaccurate <coughs> and usually no simultaneous determination is actually carried out. So my customer recommendation is ELISAs are of particular interest for screening of raw materials, so of non of non-complex food materials for labs without chromatographic equipment. So that is <coughs> uh, also one of the major usages. Uh, ELISAs, uh, you have got specific antibodies, so you have got a, 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 a color reaction um, that is uh, to be um, um, elaborated by Sabine Baumgartner. Um, and I'm not going to go into details on that because you will have both lectures and uh, lab training on that, but nonetheless, it's important to point it out because I'm supposed to mention all the methods which are state of the art. But let me just uh, mention that uh, uh, there is a, a move towards easy to use immunoassays. There are actually two main ways for ELISA based multi assays. Um, <coughs> one uh, is actually determination of groups with cross reactive, uh, reactive antibodies. You find actually antibodies which are, uh, which are able to detect both. Uh, at um, acetylated deoxynivalenol, nivalenol, and deoxynivalenol. And so that is one way of kind of having a multi assay uh, in kind of in a total um, 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 toxin approach. <coughs> or you uh, use different specific antibodies in separate rows. For instance, here you could actually have different rows uh, or uh, micro data plates. So usually the, uh, the uh, rapid tests are easy to use, yes or no tests. However, the price for the simplification is a loss of sensitivity. Uh, usually, uh, strip tests like this are not as sensitive as an ELISA test, also because there is no washing step, there is hardly any rinsing step. With ELISA, you actually uh, you have more degrees of freedom, so to speak. Uh, so extremely good antibodies are uh, needed for easy-to-use tests uh, to integrate <coughs> these antibodies in a, in a, stip, in a, in a dipstick immunocard, lateral flow device, uh, so there are actually different uh, setups. <coughs> uh, this is uh, how uh, in, uh, a, a dipstick for the mycotoxin T2 toxin can look like. You've actually got a control line which indicates that uh, with the species-specific antibodies that the ELISA is principally working properly. Uh, and then we've got a second line which is the, uh, the test line which indicates you uh, according to the intensity, the presence of a mycotoxin. The more intense the line is, the less mycotoxin you have there and the other way around because this is a so-called uh, direct uh, con uh, competitive assay. All the competitive assays uh, show a kind of a confusing result, uh, high signal, low concentration, um, and uh, uh, a low signal, high concentration. That can, however, be integrated in a, in a, a photometric reflectant measurement device, which gives you uh, a value uh, for um, the, semi, the semi quantitative value of uh, a certain mycotoxin. <coughs> and uh, just to round that up, that actually uh, reporting results uh, that uh, when you have such a, st a strip test <coughs> and uh, you uh, perform measurements of T2 toxin in natural contaminated wheat. 259 microgram per kilogram down to 32 microgram per kilogram in the blank. You perform 10 measurements and you get actually how many positive results do I get and how many negative results. Certainly any negative result is an absolute no-go. Uh, a positive result is acceptable but uh, uh, it is not to be overinterpreted. Uh, uh, but uh, that is why we have got a cut of value, which is the concentration threshold below which positive identification becomes unreliable. And you can actually see that at the level of 79 mi microgram per kilogram of T2 toxin, you have 10 replicate measurements, you have 10 positive results, 
no negative, uh, negative results. However, if you go lower, 64, you have got 10 replicates, only six positive results, four negative results. So that is the cutoff value uh, of that test kit. So you would actually recommend a customer or you as a user, well, that test is not to be um, used for concentrations lower than that or any concentration uh, below uh, 80 cannot uh, be measured. That is very important to be aware of that. <coughs> and that's last but not but least, there are so-called uh, emerging technologies like MIT and NIR and near-infrared screening, fluorescence polarization, biosensors with uh, uh, surface plasma resonance, so SPR staying for surface plasma resonance, electrochemical immunoassays, uh, non-instrumental screening techniques uh, with uh, columns where, 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 for instance, have here <coughs> um, a, um, a flow through, uh, 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 a flow flow through column where you are able to trap your analyte of interest in a certain zone, then you put this whole thing into a photometer uh, and uh, can measure the, uh, the mycotoxin right away. So a combination of solid phase extraction column with a detection device by putting the uh, extraction, uh, uh, the solid phase extraction column right into the photometer. Well, that is a method which we have uh, developed on our own, which uh, is uh, one of these emerging methods uh, which might uh, be of interest in the future. <coughs> For that particular project, I just got last month uh, the indication that uh, we get another 1.5 million euro from the European Commission. It's about uh, meter infrared screening. So what we do is actually is here, <coughs> we put a mace powder sample on a crystal and then actually we couple here an infrared beam into this crystal and uh, the infrared beam migrates through a couple of internal reflection uh, through this uh, crystal and at each point of, of a reflection point it, uh, it, uh, uh, it uh, interacts with, uh, the, uh, with the matrix of interest. So in this case the matrix of interest could be uh, dioxinivalenol containing maze uh, we have got an electromagnetic field which is actually penetrating into that material uh, and as some uh, electromagnetic energy penetrates into the material once there is actually a change in the matrix as a result of the fusarium infection, this might be detected, detectable through specific absorption bands in, uh, in an infrared uh, detector. <coughs> and this is actually how a blank in blue sample and the contaminated in red sample looks like. As you can see, you see nothing. It actually it looks the same. So you need actually chemometric evaluation uh, by looking actually into the carbohydrate bands and the carbonyl bands uh, and also the amide region, which is protein. Once there is a toxin there, there is a fungus there, then actually the protein content might, might change. Also the protein content and composition might change of the, of the material. And actually, believe it or not, you can actually distinguish uh, for chemometric evaluation between blank maize down to 300 mi uh, microgram per kilogram and contaminated maize in this region. And uh, we actually, we, we haven't received uh, uh, further funding. There was also not interest by, by industry. Why? Because simply the light sources were not strong enough. Now there's a new generation of mid infrared uh, emitting lights, which is so-called which is the so-called quantum cascade lasers. And uh, these lasers can and will now be employed to further, uh, further uh, develop that methodology. A method which is already uh, established is uh, the use of biosensors, so-called surface plasma resonance. <coughs> you again have an ATR crystal with a prism. This ATR crystal, so attenuated total reflection, is coated with a gold film and the, on this gold film you have got uh, a, a couple of specific antibodies or uh, anti-gene protein uh, uh, conjugates uh, immobilized. You've got a flow channel bringing in the sample with the mycotoxins and once my, a mycotoxin binds to the antibody or the, in, the, in the sense of a competitive reaction uh, you have actually 
uh, antibodies binding to the anti-gene protein complex. Then uh, the polarized light, which is coupled into the sensor chip, will, owing to the change in the refractive index here, uh, change uh, the angle of the reflected light, which can actually be measured through an absorption minimum, the so-called a resonance frequency. So this is a complicated technique, but just to give you an idea uh, that there is actually surface plasma resonance which works the way gold-coated uh, gold uh, um, um, crystal antibodies and then uh, light change in reflective index and change of the uh, angle of reflection. Uh, these uh, uh, antibody-based systems can also be integrated in so-called microarrays. So actually you can imagine a glass slide like this, which contains 24 individual reaction chambers. Each of these chambers contains epoxy modified uh, um, glass uh, areas with uh, the antibody, uh, sorry, with the antigen, the mycotoxin coupled to a protein. And again, you have got uh, antibodies, these antibodies are labeled with a fluorescence uh, uh, dye and once there is uh, mycotoxin in your sample, these antibodies will compete with the same mycotoxin in solution and the mycotoxin which is actually immobilized to this glass slide and again the more mycotoxin the solution, the fewer of these uh, fluorescent labeled antibodies will reach the surface and will, will, will actually give different uh, light intensities which you actually can uh, measure with an appropriate detector. That is science fiction, not, not really, and then there has been, there has been a couple of uh, measurements and also, um, uh, and also uh, developments in that area, but it has not reached routine uh, analytical level yet. So let me summarize that a cleanup mainly surface <coughs> solid phase extraction Multifunctional immunoaffinity columns are still uh, the most important cleanup techniques in use. Uh, thin layer chromatography and also high performance liquid chromatography are still the most frequently employed analytical methods for the official determination of mycotoxins. LC tandem mass spectrometry is increasingly used for the simultaneous quantification and identification that is the major strength of MS that you can do quantification and identification at the same <coughs> time point of more than 300 fungal metabolites or, and also including bacterial ones. Uh, I've also pointed out the importance of certified reference materials and also certified calibrants uh, to reveal systematic errors. And finally, easy to use uh, assays are mainly based on antibody-based systems. So that is actually still, uh, nothing has changed, the, the, nothing has changed ma much over the last 10 years. All the rapid assays which are around are still based on proper antibodies and uh, that is uh, why it is actually still a tough business in order uh, to uh, find uh, appropriate uh, rapid uh, test systems. Well, and with this, uh, um, thanks, you, thanks for listening and uh, I'm open for, for the discussion if you have still some energy left before, you have, uh, before we have the uh, coffee break. Thanks.